This is Tufts Medical Center's injury prevention program called Aging Strong. Aging Strong can be found under the QATV's health links. Also, Aging Strong is Tufts Medical Center's injury prevention and outreach program that aims to inform and empower older adults with information that can help them live a nice, full, and safe life. Today's topic is Parkinson's disease. And before I introduce Ann Muscuff, who will be talking about living well with Parkinson's disease, I just want to share with you a statistics that I found from the Parkinson's.org. Did you know that about 90,000 people in the U.S. are diagnosed with Parkinson's disease each year? And worldwide, about 10 million people are living with Parkinson's disease. That's pretty scary. And unfortunately, well, fortunately, people are living longer, which is great. But the incidence of Parkinson's disease does go up as we age. So I want to introduce you to Ann Muscuff. She is the director of the Charlotte and Richard Okinaw Parkinson's Family Support Program from the Jewish Family and Children's Services. Ann, welcome. Thank you so much. So happy that you're here. I want to learn more about Parkinson's disease. Before you, as well as you're um, setting up your slides, can yes. you just share with us how you got into working with people who are living with Parkinson's? Absolutely. So I'm an occupational therapist. I went to graduate school and one of my fieldwork placements was um, doing an exercise group for people with Parkinson's disease in an assisted living facility. And I just loved it. Um, I love the people. I loved seeing them exercise and, and living well with Parkinson's. And um, it's it's been a thread throughout my career. I have to say that um, it was really interesting to me to think that a disease that starts in the brain could be overcome using the brain. So I just thought that was really interesting. And um, I just uh, really enjoyed it. So it's not been my sole um, practice as an occupational therapist, but it's been um, throughout my career, and especially in these last few years since I've been um, with Jewish Family and Children's Service. Great. Thank you. I can't yeah. wait to learn from you. I know there's so much information out there. Mm hmm Yes. Yeah, so thanks again for having me. And um, I hope to really uh, explain how people can really live well with Parkinson's disease. Um, as you said, I'm an occupational therapist and the director of the Charlotte and Richard O'Connor Parkinson's Family Support Program at Jewish Family and Children's Service, which is based in Waltham, Massachusetts. I'd just like to share a few disclosures. Um, first, that JFNCS is a nonprofit and non-sectarian uh, organization. And we do provide therapeutic arts-based programs, so a dance class and a chorus. Um, we also have support groups for care partners and adult children of those with Parkinson's um, and information and referral. As well, I am, uh, I've been LSVT BIG certified, and I'll share a little bit more about that later in the presentation. It's a treatment program for Parkinson's. And I'm not a doctor, nor do I play one on TV. <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> In a nutshell, Parkinson's is a highly variable and complex disease, which requires holistic care for optimal wellness. So it affects the whole person, and therefore you need to treat the whole person. And I'll be describing a little bit more about this as I go on. Now, if I was in a room of people, I might ask you to raise your hand if you know someone with Parkinson's, or maybe you're even living with Parkinson's. But instead, I'll just show you some people that you might recognize that have had some for form of Parkinson's um, that are more well-known. People like Janet Reno, Billy Graham, John Paul P uh, the Pope, Brian Grant, who's an NBA player, Alden Alda. And of course, most people are familiar with Michael J. Fox since he has a foundation. So you can see that this affects people of all walks of life. Um, and some, you know, get it early on, some a little bit later in life. Now, sometimes people will say they went to the doctor and they were given a diagnosis of, diagnosis of Parkinsonism. And what that is, is that's an umbrella term that refers to um, a bunch of symptoms that look similar, they present similarly. Um, but what it includes is all these other diagnoses under this umbrella. The most prominent is something called idiopathic Parkinson's disease. 
And what I mean by idiopathic is they don't know what the cause is specifically. Sometimes um, a doctor won't know exactly what type of Parkinson's someone might have. It's just a matter of time, seeing how someone responds to treatment. And so um, some alternate diagnoses under this umbrella are things like a drug-induced or vascular Parkinsonisms, multi-system atrophy, dementia with Lewy bodies, progressive supranuclear palsy, and corticobasal degeneration. Now, when a diagnosis is made, most of the time it is with a clinical exam. So a movement disorder specialist is a neurologist with specialized training. And what they'll do is they'll take a look at movements, they'll do some tests in the clinic, and they will say, I think you have Parkinson's. As well, more recently, there's been a few more tests to help um, hone in on that diagnosis. None of them are 100% sure, but there are things called a DAT scan. So that's injecting dye, looking at a scan of the brain, and looking at those areas specifically where Parkinson's is known to have less of the dopamine. There's a test um, that looks at the cerebrospinal fluid, another one that looks at the skin, and they're looking for these abnormal proteins that are associated with Parkinson's disease. But right now there's no clear biomarker. So there's no blood test for Parkinson's, much like someone with diabetes might have um, an A1C taken and they can see how the disease is doing, if it's progressing and how they're doing and, and those sorts of things. There's not such a thing for Parkinson's, but certainly there is um, research being done to try to find these things. So, the cardinal motor symptoms or movement symptoms that a doctor is looking at when they um, diagnose Parkinson's. The first is something called bradykinesia or a slowness of movement. And the way we can remember that, especially here in New England, is it's not like our friend Tom. So mm -hmm. we're, it's a slowness. It's not that nimbleness so much. They're also looking at a stiffness or rigidity of muscles. Um, a resting tremor, which means that there's a shaking when someone's at rest, not when they're moving. And um, this does not necessarily happen for everyone with Parkinson's, but it is common. As well, there might be um, something called postural instability so that, that um, when someone's balance is challenged, that they might not be able to recover and they could fall. Um, this often is presented later on in the disease. That's why it's in parentheses here. Um, about 80% of dopamine producing neurons are lost before these symptoms are easily recognized um, by some estimates. So in summary, Parkinson's is looking at movements and they're becoming slower and smaller. And what I will um, share with you is just how these things look as I describe the symptoms. Now, when we look at what's visible in Parkinson's, some of you who may be more familiar with Parkinson's may be able to see someone in a crowd and, and think, huh, they look like they have Parkinson's. When James Parkinson um, described Parkinson's in 1817, this diagram came up and it's, it's a picture of an elderly gentleman who's bent over. He has um, his hands in a position. He might be doing something called pill rolling, but it's, it's a form of tremor. Thankfully, even though this has been pervasive in the literature, in 2020, someone said, wait a minute, Parkinson's isn't just one uh, man who's stooped over. That's not what Parkinson's looks for, like for everyone. Um, it affects all ethnicities and it, it does affect men about one and a half times more than women. But um, through this diagram, you can see that Parkinson's may occur in someone who's younger, a woman, for example, she might be active running but you might notice a, a small tremor or some sort of cramp in her foot. Uh, the second diagram there is a gentleman who has something called on and off time. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but basically it just means that they may present differently if their medications are working well or not working well. They may have extra movements or they may be stiff. So it's not the same for everyone. And finally, there's a gentleman who may have postural problems, but he's helped, he's, he's able to walk well using an assistive, assistive device. Now, there's also quite a number of less visible and invisible Parkinson's symptoms. I'm going to present a pretty long list of these. And this is not to overwhelm anyone, but really for those who, um, you know, 
don't have Parkinson's, they can help gain a sympathy or empathy for people with Parkinson's and the things that they're see they're not seeing, but maybe, you know, realize later, oh, that's why this is challenging for them. If you do have Parkinson's, you know, these symptoms, recognizing that they're part of the disease can help you get treatment. Some doctors forget to bring these things up. So it's important that you know what they are so you can bring them up to them and they can, they can help address them. So some of the first um, symptoms, which may even come before a diagnosis, are loss of sense of smell, constipation, or that slowness of movement in the gut, a REM sleep behavior disorder. So this is when someone may act out their dreams. They may punch or kick or yell in their dream, in their sleep. As well, depression and anxiety may um, be early on, even before a diagnosis. Handwriting may change, something called micrographia, micro being smaller, graphia being writing. Someone may notice that. And again, that's the smaller movements. Fatigue, certainly. Cognitive changes, especially when um, in executive function or the organization and planning and decision-making part of the brain. It also may be a slowness of thinking. Apathy or that challenge of you know not caring or it being difficult to motivate. Facial masking. So again, of course, we have muscles in our faces. And when um, when those movements get smaller and slower, it may present as someone who's maybe sort of flat and they're not reacting to things as much. That doesn't mean that they're not processing it and that they're not feeling it, but it just may not present in their face as well. Delusions and hallucinations may be part of it, especially later on in the disease. Um, challenges with blood pressure, so especially um, a lowering of blood pressure and how um, the body is able to respond and the autonomic nervous system can be affected. There's also an increased risk of melanoma, sexual dysfunction, changes in vision, things like dry eye, double vision, challenges with, um, with contrast sensitivity, even perspiration and dandruff. Um, incontinence, pain, drooling, and impulse control disorders. So these are just a few, but things that really can be affected by that lack of dopamine and other neurochemicals in the brain. All in all, it's considered what we call a snowflake disease because there's a saying, if you've seen one person with Parkinson's, you've seen one person with Parkinson's. So not everyone has the same symptoms. Not everyone has the same reaction to the treatments. Not everyone has the same trajectory of the disease. It may be that someone has Parkinson's for decades. It may be that it goes more quickly. It's different for everyone. So that's the important thing to remember. Now looking a little bit more at treatment. So I always believe that treatment should be holistic, of course, hopeful and human-centered. The first and most important thing with diagnosis of a Parkinson's is to build a team. So always, I believe that the person with Parkinson's, that PWP there should be the center of the care. It should be your goals, your quality of life that drives what goes on um, in your treatment. I hope that people with Parkinson's can surround themselves with supportive family and friends. That's really important too. Then in terms of a medical um help. There's certainly a primary care doctor who can help coordinate the care. And we always recommend someone sees a movement disorder specialist. Again, that's a specialized kind of neurologist. Then they can make referrals um, to physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, social workers, behavioral health professionals, and many other specialists. Someone may need a urologist, for example, for incontinence. A nutritionist may be helpful. Even a music therapist. So in terms of medical interventions first, the gold standard for Parkinson's is this little yellow pill. And this is called Cinemet, also known as Carbidopa Levodopa. Um, it has other forms um, based on how it's put into the system. It's a pill, extended release, a gel, inhaled powder, these things. And they have different names such as Parcopa or Riteri. You may hear some of these or Duopa. Um, there are side effects as with anything. It could cause nausea, dyskinesia. So that's that extra movement. So when people usually see or think of Michael J. Fox when he's been interviewed, he has a lot of these extra movements. And that's really something called dyskinesia. 
Um, again, low blood pressure can be not only part of the Parkinson's, but also a side effect of the medication. Um, impulse control disorders, hallucinations, and even creativity. There have been some people who um, I know of personally, actually, that uh, upon taking this extra dopamine for their brain, they've since learned how to compose music. It's really interesting. And then I also wanted to point out that some people talk about this on and off effect of, of medications. It doesn't happen with everyone, but it does tend to happen later on in, in the disease. And basically what it means is that as the the medication crosses the blood-brain barrier and gets to a therapeutic level in the brain, symptoms tend to go away. But then as it breaks down, the symptoms may return. And sometimes this is really something someone can feel. So as you can imagine, this would affect someone's um, day-to-day life, how they schedule things, how they're feeling based on when they take the medications and based on how the medications are working in their body. And because medications are such a key part of treating the um, Treating Parkinson's disease, it's important to remember to keep to a schedule, as prescribed, of course, and to know that Cinemet is best absorbed on an empty stomach. Um, For some people, not everyone, but a lot of people, um, protein can interact with how it's absorbed through the gut, so avoiding protein at the same time. Of course, if someone gets nauseous, they can take, um, you know, crackers or something with it, and that may help. Um, But pill systems, alarms, things like that can be really helpful to to living well with it, to keeping keeping the medication at a therapeutic level. Um, I just put a picture here, for example, of something called uh, a squeeze pouch. So, you know, you can be on the go. You can you can go out to lunch with your friends. You can you can go to a play or a movie. But remember to take that Parkinson's medication with you to help you stay mobile and um, and feeling good. The last medical intervention I wanted to mention is something called deep brain stimulation, sometimes known as DBS. And what this is, it's like a pacemaker for the brain. It requires surgery. And these leads are placed in the brain where um, where the Parkinson's is known to, to affect. And it sends an electrical signal to stimulate that part of the brain. It's not a full substitute for the medications. And um, to be eligible for this surgery, you need to demonstrate that the medications are helpful with the symptoms. Um, Another criteria is that there should be no obvious cognitive impairment since there's a risk of the surgery. And it's really just for that idiopathic Parkinsonism, not the um, more specialized types. Then when it comes to allied health, physical therapy um, should be, I hope, the next thing you get after a diagnosis, a prescription for physical therapy. What they can do for you is give you an individualized assessment and plan for exercise. Exercise is so key. And everyone is different, as I said. Someone may have a stiff shoulder. Sometimes people come into the doctor and say, ah, I think I have frozen shoulder or something, and be surprised to hear, no, you have Parkinson's. That may be because the movement and swinging the arms is not not the same. And some of the things a physical therapist can look at are things like gait or how you walk, your mobility in general, getting in and out of bed, in and out of a car, et cetera, your posture, and also balance. And I put a picture here of a train station because for someone with Parkinson's, this can be a challenging environment, the busyness, the rush, the crowds, but a physical therapist can help with strategies and techniques for getting through these these stressful situations. There are a few um, specialized therapy programs specific to Parkinson's that have been researched and and demonstrate a a functional improvement. One of them is called LSVT BIG. It stands for Lee Silverman Voice Training, um, and BIG refers to the physical therapy component. There's another one I'll talk about in a minute. Another is called Power Moves, or Parkinson's Wellness Recovery Moves. And both of these are looking at... um, recalibrating functional movements. So putting a sleeve in your in your shirt, um, looking at that and trying to counteract the slowness and the smallness by um, uh, making the amplitude bigger. So thinking of big movements. And um, so these are really wonderful programs. They're intense and they have to be given by someone who's um, been trained in them, but it's a nice option to have. I love this quote because I think it's true, Parkinson's or not. If exercise could be packaged in a pill, it would be the single most widely prescribed and beneficial medicine in the nation. So here is your reminder, 
go for a walk. It's supposed to be beautiful today. Go for a walk, exercise, whatever you need to do to stay, to stay active. When it comes to occupational therapy, uh, an OT will look at your activities of daily living. If you've heard of ADLs, these are things like eating, grooming, dressing, bathing, toileting, also your fine motor coordination, so buttons and zippers and things like that. But really your meaningful activities on a day-to-day basis, that's what an occupational therapist will help you with. And some of the ways they do that is through practice, through adaptation, looking at different ways of doing things. Um, it might be tools. So adaptive equipment is what we call those. And an occupational therapist may also do an LSVT big with your goals in mind and your activities. Next is speech therapy. So a speech therapist can help with things like volume and articulation. So many times people with Parkinson's have something called hypophonia or low voice, a quiet voice. Um, They can help with swallowing. Dysphagia is the medical term for having difficulty with swallowing. And also they can help with cognition. Again, that executive functioning and processing. And some of the specialized programs uh, for speech therapy are the LSVT, but loud. So that was actually the first iteration of this. And another um, somewhat newer one is something called Speak Out with the Parkinson's Voice Project. And they have a follow-up group in most cases called the Loud Crowd. So a conversation group to help keep up the skills. Mental health is, uh, of course, an important topic uh, these days for everyone, but especially for Parkinson's, it can affect uh, up to 50% of people um, with depression and anxiety. As well, I mentioned apathy before, that these are challenges around mental health. These are often under-recognized due to the overlap of symptoms. I mentioned that that flat affect. So someone may just think, oh, that's the Parkinson's with the muscles, but it may also be, you know, having some struggles behind that. It's important to know this is very treatable. Therapy and medications can help. So please don't think you're alone. As well in the community, there are many community supports. Um, Things like home safety evaluations. People can get these um, different ways um, through home health services. Medicare will pay for home safety evaluations by a physical or occupational therapist. Um, There are certainly private companies who do them as well. Advanced planning. None of us like to do this, but it is so important. It is such a gift to um, your family and friends to think about what are your wishes. So contacting an elder lawyer to help with your assets, Um, filling out um, a medical order of life-sustaining treatment or a MOLST form is, is really important. Care management. Um, Care managers are wonderful, um, helps to you to help. um, I I like to think of them as like a third party, someone who can take a bird's eye view of of your life, try to help you plan where you're going and what might be best for you. They can help coordinate things from meals and groceries and um, transportation, getting, you know, some, some personal care in the home, things like that. Care managers can come from places like um, insurance companies, doctor's offices, and there are certainly private um, pay managed care managers as well. And then it's important to look at your community resources. So the aging service access points, um, also called ASAPs and COAs, the councils on aging. So that's your local senior center. There are a lot of wonderful resources there. Um, Look them up, give them a call, explain your situation, and they're more than happy to help. As well, I encourage people to seek out support groups. Um, There are many different types out there for people with Parkinson's. As well, there's some specialized support groups for care partners and adult children, for those with young onset Parkinson's, which is defined as um, under 50 years old, for those newly diagnosed, and also for women. So there's also wonderful community wellness programs. So the, the therapy you receive is wonderful. Often it's just an insurance benefit, which means it will end at some point. So these community wellness programs can help you to continue to stay active. They can give you some social support, something to do. Um, there are many that are specific for Parkinson's. For example, there's a dance for Parkinson's, uh, Tremble Clef's Chorus, uh, something called Rock Steady Boxing, which has been more popular in, in recent years. 
There's Tai Chi and yoga for Parkinson's, spinning, um, you know, on a bicycle, uh, boot camps. There's even drumming and art therapy for Parkinson's. And all these things can, can provide a benefit. I also love this quote that until there's a cure, because there unfortunately is not a cure right now, there's community. So finding a community and finding those supports is so helpful for living with Parkinson's. But don't take it from me. I asked uh, our dance group, I said, how do you live well with Parkinson's? What would you tell someone? And here's what they had to say. They said, make and stick to a schedule with exercise and social activities every day. So again, it's challenging. We all have that. It's winter, you know, <laughs> none of us really like to get out when it's so cozy at home, but having that schedule, having that accountability can really be helpful and the benefits are, are enormous. Another said, use humor and music. The, these are so beneficial for all of us again, um, but can also help with things like anxiety and, um, you know, stress in life prevent injury. So um, as with anyone, having a broken bone can be a true setback, but they find unfortunately with Parkinson's, especially being in the hospital can, can set you back in more ways. So anything you can do to prevent and make yourself safer is, is important. Another said, reach out to people, stay connected and rally your supports. Stay curious, be engaged and interested. Certainly, um, if you're watching this, that's that's a great start that you're you're wanting to learn more. There's so many wonderful programs out there. It could be learning a new hobby. It could be, um, you know, something related to Parkinson's or something totally not. But stay curious. There's always more to learn. And finally, adapt. Um, manage your expectations and recognize your limitations, but adapt. It's okay to grieve losses. But this is a part of life. None of us can do the same things at 80 years old that we could do at 20 years old. And so um, learning to adapt um, with whatever is, is challenging to you is, is a huge um, benefit to living well with Parkinson's. And that's sort of a teaser to my part two presentation when we'll, I'll be talking even more about how to adapt um, for functional daily activities. I just wanted to close with a few local resources. Um, so again, Jewish Family and Children's Service or JFNCS, we have um, programming, information and referral in your area. Um, the Parkinson Foundation has uh, what they call centers of excellence. And so these are Mass General Hospital and Beth Israel Hospital, um, as well the American Parkinson's Disease Association Massachusetts chapter is through um, Boston Medical Center, and they have a wonderful website with a lot of resources, including a listing of movement disorder specialists, like some at Tufts University, for example, or Tufts um, Medical. So those are some local resources. As well, there's quite a wealth of national resources. So that APDA, I'm listing some websites here. The Parkinson's Foundation, the Davis Finney Foundation. Davis Finney was an Olympic cyclist and has a wonderful manual called uh, One Vi Every Victory Counts and um, really focuses on living well with Parkinson's. Of course, most people are familiar with the Michael J. Fox Foundation. They have a lot of uh, wonderful research out there. There's also something called the Parkinson and Movement Disorders Alliance uh, based out of uh, Arizona that has a lot of programming. Uh, there's just so many resources out there around articles, webinars, um, things like that. And thank you so much. This is my contact information. Should I be um, a support to you? I'm more than happy to just contact me there. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I was just taking notes, taking notes <laughs> as you were talking. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my Great. goodness. Yeah. Great information. Um, thank you. So and can you share with us, um, it seems it seems like Parkinson's disease, when I think about it, and just from your explanation, it's a disease where everything, you said slower, but there's this stiffening, there's stiffening of the, the body, the muscles, um, which could cause pain. Is that mm -hmm. where the pain is coming from? The, yes, the often. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. And, and how does dopamine, can you explain to us what dopamine is and how that is the big, you know, the big factor in um, creating this disease or disorder called Parkinson's? 
Yeah. Well, as a reminder, I'm not a doctor, but <laughs> dopamine is something called a neurochemical. So, you know, the brain works um, through these neurochemicals. They're like messengers between all the nerve cells in your brain. And they're what help you to move, to think, to do all these things. And so dopamine is, is the key one. It's not the only one in Parkinson's and there's, there's many different neurochemicals, uh, but it's, it's one that's especially key for movement, for smooth movement, for, um, you know, that the reactions and things like that, that, that help with movement. So um, with the lack of dopamine, it makes it more difficult to initiate movement and to have that smooth non-tremulous um, movement. So part um, dopamine is, is just what, what they've discovered is, is the key um, neurotransmitter. Um, but when you mentioned stiffness, you know, it's, yes, it, it is a reason that many people experience pain. Some people complain of back pain or joint pain. Um, and I mentioned stiff shoulders, things like that. But it is treatable. Um, you know, that's what physical therapy can help with in terms of stretches and exercises, um, you know, things like yoga, even meditation and breathing can help. Um, because when people feel anxious, they might um, tense up. And that certainly contributes to that stiffness. Um, you know, um, the medications certainly help a lot with the stiffness. But you know, I've, I've certainly had people come from our dance class say, you know, when I came here, I was so stiff. I had, I had these cramps. And by the time I was done, I felt so much better because we've listened to music. We've had social, you know, time we've, we've danced, you know, and that really brings a lot of joy. So. Yeah. So yeah. because you mentioned music and there's different types of, um, per, you mentioned that, um, uh, JFNCS um, mm -hmm. offers therapeutic art-based programs, right? Mm -hmm. So that's in the form of music and art also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how does music, how does music therapy help people with Parkinson's? Yeah, great question. So one thing I love about music is so that I think is so interesting. I once heard it described as fireworks for the brain, because when we listen to music and when we play music, when we sing, even if you feel like you can't sing well or on key, it doesn't matter. Music stimulates so many different parts of the brain, you know, your hearing, your seeing, your, you know, movement and how you interpret that. So um, so music is really powerful because even if one part of the brain is affected, there's so many other parts that are still active working with music, but there's this rhythmic auditory stimulation. This is part of us that responds to rhythm in the majority of people. I mean, there's a very small percentage that say they have no rhythm, no beat, but really that's, it's very, um, uncommon. In fact, you know, there's, the internet is full of videos where even animals like birds will be bobbing to the music because we can pick up a beat. And so when we pick up that beat, our, we can respond with our movement. And so walking, that's one of the wonderful ways that music can be helpful. Someone with Parkinson's, um, they have a shuffling gait or festinating gait. And um, someone once called that stutter sh steps. I've heard it called that where start out, but then sort of get like shorter and shorter. But with a strong beat, you know, cueing us to take steps at a regular rhythm um, can be re really beneficial for walking well through a room, through a crowd, you know, through a doorway. One thing I didn't talk about is something called freezing of gait, um, which can be common where a narrow, crowded, um, small space can cause someone to freeze up. And it, it's like they really feel like their feet are stuck to the floor. There are a lot of strategies for, for helping someone become unstuck, but one of the most powerful is music and thinking of a beat, um, thinking of a song or something that has that, um, that movement that you can stimulate in your brain to, to move along. So it's, it's really powerful and it brings joy. I mean, it dopamine is, you know, that feel good, you know, serotonin, dopamine, all these things, the feel good chemicals in the brain. There are songs that, you know, trigger your memory, maybe a special song with you and a loved one, maybe something from your childhood when you were on a road trip, you know, so many different ways that music can, can bring joy and, and help people to, to have that, um, to experience joy and improved movement and, and so many things. So it's a wonderful, wonderful tool. 
Yeah, I saw on um, a few years back, I saw on YouTube, this, um, I believe she was a physical therapist, and she was doing home visits with somebody who was living with Parkinson's, this gentleman. And um, they showed the before where she would, you know, ask him to move, he was sitting down, and he was just very stiff, and he had the tremors, right. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then it the, she put on a, a CD that had a music mm-hmm. and it was almost like a waltz type music. Mm-hmm. And so she just had him listen and then helped him up. And then next thing you know, he, you see him just kind of like, you know, him and the therapist just kind of walking up, dancing and kind of mm-hmm. like so graceful yeah around the living room into the kitchen and Mm -hmm. then just to prove her point because he was upright with the walker he she stopped the music and then you could see his body change Mm. and his body became more stiff Mm -hmm. and then again to further emphasize the, the effect and the power of music she turned the music back on and there he goes. He's listening to it. And then he's just kind of almost like so gliding across, you know, and looking so graceful and very much in control of his movement. And yeah. that kind of hit me up how powerful music is. Oh, indeed. I mean, it, it affects, you know, mood too. I mean, when you think about it, you know, sometimes we, you know, music can either get us into a mood or match our mood. So, you know, feeling a little sluggish in the morning, we all have that, but put on that peppy music and then you're okay. You're, before you know it, you're starting to move to the music and, 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 you know, move better. So, and the music part of our, our chorus, um, you know, so people with Parkinson's can have, like I mentioned, challenges with their voice. Um, and that's related to breath support, but, um, you know, challenges with articulation, all these things. But again, music um, and the ability to sing can really improve those. There's been studies around it, even actually swallowing, because the same uh, muscles that help with singing can help with swallowing. So again, you know, you don't have to you don't have to be on a stage. You don't have to be on tune. You just have to enjoy it and, and make that effort. And, um, and music can really um, have so many benefits. Yeah, I'm sure it offers such a powerful release mm-hmm. in a good way. Yeah. Uh, we talked about speech therapy. Can you talk talk <laughs> a little <laughs> bit more about how speech therapy can benefit um, people who uh, are drooling a lot or having a hard time swallowing or mm-hmm. maybe speaking? What would they be doing um, as far as exercises goes to help those people? Yeah, well, so they would evaluate it, first of all, you know, to make sure that they understand where the where the challenges are coming from, and to make sure that someone who may be having swallowing difficulties are safely swallowing. So they might um, recommend a change in diet consistency in terms of liquids, um, you know, maybe thin liquids are a little bit too fast for that reaction to swallow them and protect the airway. So they might recommend something to thicken the liquids and and help with swallowing them more safely. Um, so that's that's first, you know, and foremost to um, a safe swallow. But they might also t- um, share some techniques around, you know, tucking a chin while swallowing to again protect the airway um, and to practice a double swallow or hard swallow. All these things to um, to make someone more conscious of what they're doing and. Um, and protect it so that they can eat um, and have that quality of life, but do it in a safe manner. So exercises, strategies, things like that around swallowing. Um, in terms of articulation, you know, again, the movement of the tongue and the lips and the, you know, all those things, again, exercises um, can be helpful for that and, and strategies. Um, those those programs I mentioned, the LSVT Loud and the Speak Out, um, work really with helping to um, amplify voice. So to someone with Parkinson's, they may feel like they're speaking at a normal tone, but really it's it's barely a whisper. So to compensate, they'll often say to speak loud, pretend like you're projecting in a room full of people. And that, you know, just again, how the brain sort of can trick itself. And if you think that you're speaking to a room of people, it sort of balances out that you're speaking in a normal tone of voice with Parkinson's. So it's using some of these brain strategies for, um, for how you, the volume at which someone speaks. Wow. Wow. You know, um, 
as you're as you're talking, it just brings me back to my bedside nursing days. Mm -hmm. We used to have um, patients who had a hard time swallowing and they were on aspiration precaution is mm -hmm. what we call it. So that means they need to, they need to make sure that they had to be upright when they're eating. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned thickening the liquid because if the liquid is like water, it just goes down way too fast. They mm -hmm. can't, that speed of the swallow can cause them to cough and maybe some of the fluid can go into the lungs causing pneumonia. Right. Right. How we had to do um, add thickets. So it's almost like a rice powder type thing mm -hmm. to really make sure the consistency was as good enough so that the person can control the swallow. Mm -hmm. So as you were saying that, just I can't help but think how important the caregivers are, people who are mm -hmm. taking care of the person living with Parkinson's, because they're probably the ones who are preparing the meals. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Yeah. Yes. So a lot of good education um, would probably be beneficial for the caregivers. Absolutely. Yeah. What to look for and, and even to, um, you know, recognize what, how someone's doing again, whether those medications are on or off, if they're tired, you know, uh, sometimes with the low blood pressure, you see it well before you ever measure it. You know, someone just, it looks like they're powering down. Um, they might even be slumped to the side. Um, again, in later stages. And so knowing, you know, is this a good time to really be, you know, eating or maybe do they need a rest first? Um, you know, things like that. I will say that, you know, the majority of people don't have problems with swallowing until later in the disease. Um, so it's not necessarily an issue for everyone for quite a while, but it is something, you know, just to be aware of because it's important to address. And again, you know, having those activities, those exercises to stay strong and to try to delay the progression of the disease is so important. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. yeah. Does the, does the disease, I guess it depends on how old the person lives, but does it, does it get worse or is there a, a time where it just kind of, it doesn't get worse for a person. It's just kind of stays at a certain level or mm -hmm. does the progression happen. Forever? Yeah, that's a great question. And again, take it from the experts. When I asked someone once, you know, what would you want someone to know about Parkinson's? They said that there are plateaus, you know, that it's not a constant, you know, downward slope. And again, you know, some therapies and things like that, sort of like, you know, a tune up as we call them can really be helpful in that. So you know, over time, unfortunately, it is considered a progressive disease, but it doesn't mean that it's from day one, it's just nothing but downhill. Certainly not. There can be improvements. You know, someone may not realize that they're having challenges, but they go to a therapist who recognizes that, brings it to their attention, works on it, does exercises, and they can improve. Mm -hmm. So um, it, again, it's different for everyone, but um, but there is that option. Yeah. Now, if yeah. people, if, is it hereditary and is there a way to do genetic testing to mm. see if a person, the siblings, the children uh, of a, per a person who had Parkinson's, is there a way for their children to do a genetic testing to see if they're at higher risk? Yeah, that's a great question. And of course, that's um, a lot of the research. There have been uh, genes that have been identified that put someone at a higher risk of um, getting Parkinson's. Um, the last estimate I read, which I think has probably changed now, that was about accounted for about 10% of cases of Parkinson's. Um, but certainly, yes, there is genetic dis testing. Um, the Parkinson's Foundation has something called the PD gene, gen gene narration, if you can imagine, G-E-N-E. -E. Um, and what they do is it's they do testing, you know, they're trying to collect data. So they offer free testing for um, someone who has Parkinson's to help identify those genes. Um, but, you know, there are environmental factors as well. So um, things um, like in the environment, um, for example, Agent Orange, there's a, um, a known risk uh, for veterans who've been exposed to Agent Orange that may have it. There's some um, fertilizers, uh, Paraquat, I believe is one, that can be um, identified as environmental um, you know, triggers for, for Parkinson's. So yes, it can be genetic, but not always. That's why they call it idiopathic. And um, you know, that's why there's a ton of research being done to help un understand. But Again, um, exercise is the best thing you can do to protect your brain and your, your health. 
Um, mm -hmm. Exercising, you mean physical exercises or, and, or maybe chess, Sudoku, word, crossword <laughs> puzzles or word, word, what do you call that? Wordicle or <laughs> wordle. Yeah, <Yes>. absolutely. <laughs> yes, absolutely. All of the above. I mean, anything you can do to stay active in your mind and body um, are so important. And, um, you know, I actually get the question a lot, what is the best kind of exercise for Parkinson's? And certainly, you know, what, what makes you feel good? If you're, you're having more stiffness symptoms, yoga may be helpful, um, but it should challenge you. You know, that's how our brains work for that, that word you've probably heard called neuroplasticity. That's, you know, be, being able to change the, the brain and, um, you know, it needs to be challenged to, to change, but ultimately, I always tell people whatever keeps you motivated. So if you have a friend who does boxing and you you go because they're going, that's the best exercise for you because something is always better than nothing. You know, you're always going to be burning more calories. You're always going to be um, pumping the blood more than if you were sitting on the couch watching a TV show. Not that it's bad to, you know, relax too, but um, any any kind of exercise is is best. Mm, I totally variety is, is great too. You know, again, challenging the brain in different ways. If it's boring and if it feels like the same thing, it's probably not going to benefit you the same as if it's different. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. yeah, very good. Very good. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> Can you, um, so as I was preparing for um, your presentation here, which actually is very, it's, my goodness, it's full of great information. Can you talk a little bit about CBD and um, what people are, um, how they're integrating that maybe into their treatment. Hmm. CBD as in like marijuana, I assume, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. I mean, it's, it's a hot topic, of course. Um, you know, and if you ask the doctors, you know, doctors rightly so will, will look at the research. And unfortunately there's not a great amount of research right now um, to support it. However, anecdotally, um, people do say that, you know, because it's legal in Massachusetts, that it does help relax them. Um, I think the challenge is always that it can, that can affect um, the brain, you know, for a disease that's already affecting thinking, um, something called bradyphrenia, so the slowness of thinking, you know, taking something like this that can further slow, it may not be best for judgment and for safety. So, you know, always talk to a doctor. I, they get the question all the time. So don't be shy um, and, and, you know, and see what they say. It, it may be helpful for some, but I, I can't say, you know, universally everyone should take it because of course I'm not a doctor, but, and it just essentially it's not, it's because it's not well studied, um, but it may be, may be beneficial for some. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit about um, the hand tremors, the pill mm. roll? Is, um, and I think you mentioned that you notice it more when people are at rest. Mm -hmm. right? And it's so it's if they were trying to reach for something and then you see their hands kind of start shaking, mm -hmm. that's the opposite, because, right? Right. Yes. So these are involuntary movements, it's just happening at rest. Mm -hmm. what, what causes that? Again, it's a lack of dopamine, so that the slowness of um, the lack of smooth movement. So um, it's all back to the dopamine. Um, and it often starts in the hand, but it may be in a foot or it may even be in a jaw or other body part. Um, and again, it's called a resting tremor. So someone, as they move, it goes away, but even as a pause, it can start up again. So you see this when someone's eating, you know, it can be really challenging you know, having a soup, for example, um, and, you know, scooping it, but that pause, you know, the hand starts to shake and the, the broth comes out of the spoon. Um, so that can be challenging. Um, and it may be in the, in a pill rolling, um, motion. It does get worse with things like fatigue and stress and anxiety and high emotions and things like that. So again, um, having a practice of, of meditation, of breathing, of yoga, things like that can be helpful to it. Um, there are some medications, something, a class of medications called anticholinergics that can help. Um, the deep brain stimulation can be helpful for, for tremors. Um, 
but mostly it's um, learning to adapt. You know, some people who may be more self-conscious of it early on in the disease, it usually starts on one side, I should also point out. So it'll start on one side. As the disease progresses, it will often go to the other side. So some people may just feel like, um, you know, having a pocket to put their hand in or something like that may feel more comfortable to them. Um, But, um, you know, people can still function. It's just more challenging. So um, actually just yesterday I was in uh, an art therapy class and someone was mentioning that, you know, we were doing the, the project and we were doing some painting and she said, you know what, I just already realized that as I'm breathing, as I'm focusing on this, my tremor was less. And so just, again, sort of that mind over matter sort of um, mentality can be helpful. Um, not that it's fully under, you know, control um, of the brain, but but it can really be helpful in managing it. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. the tremors themselves, is that what causes or one of the causes for the sleep disorders? Are they constantly in motion in movement that or shaking that it could that be waking them up or what, what is, what causes the sleep disorders? You mentioned mm. the sleep disorder. Yeah. It's, I don't believe it's related in that way. Um, I don't know what causes it exactly. I think, um, that's a great question. There are sleep specialists, which could be on someone's, um, someone's team because the sleep problems, I mean, some, not everyone has the REM sleep behavior disorder that where they act out their dreams, but certainly, um, falling asleep and staying asleep can also be challenges, um, with Parkinson's and with, um, you know, aging as well. So, um, there are some medications again, that can, can help with these things, but, it's great to see a doctor because, you know, we don't want the side effect of the medication. If there's a medication that helps you fall asleep and relax, but yeah, you have to get up and use the bathroom multiple times in the middle of the night. You don't want to be at a higher risk of falling um, and, you know, hurting yourself. So that's a lot of what, you know, an occupational therapist or physical therapist doing home assessment will talk about. We'll, we'll look at your home environment and, and where is the bathroom and are there night lights or things you can do um, if you do have to get up. So Sleep can be a challenge, but again, you know, there's strategies around it. Um, you know, something called sleep hygiene, you may be familiar with in, in your nursing as well, you know, teaching people it's best not to take too long of a nap during the day. Um, don't watch TV before you go to sleep. Don't have caffeinated drinks. All those sorts of things apply to people with Parkinson's or not. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, it must be a, almost like a catch 22. You mentioned um, fatigue. Mm hmm. So if somebody was fatigued, of course, they'll take naps. Right. Right. And so, and if they're not moving that much, they might get deconditioned, which would make them more tired and weak. Mm -hmm. And so if they're sleeping and napping during a day, it could throw off their sleep pattern, you know, which will disrupt their sleep hygiene. But um, it's just, uh, it's very fascinating. Can you you share with us any, um, any, experiences, positive experiences that you've had with uh, people who participates in your um, music therapy class or art therapy classes, just some, you know, give us some ideas on, you know, how it's really impacting them in in a great way. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's so hard to pick just one um, because honestly, the, I think, you know, certainly we'll have people who come into our dance class, um, especially when we had it, you know, pre-pandemic, they they walk into the room and you could tell that they were a little more stiff or you know, having more problems that morning, but walk out totally different, you know, and, and see that, you know, they were, they had joy that they had, you know, exercise and things like that. But honestly, um, what warms my heart the most is to see the connections, you know, to hear that one of them called another one to check in on them or, um, you know, that they gave each other a ride to the class or something like that, you know, having that social connection and knowing that they're not alone, that this is not something they have to do alone is, is so key um, in our program. So um, that's just what I love about it to find that community and to feel connected with them. Um, it really helps well being overall. Yeah. 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 Wow. That's positive. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's big. That's big. It also, um, it, I'm sure it shows that they're not the only ones suffering with this yeah. type of disorder, you know, that sense of common humanity, there are people out there and, um, and they can Absolutely. be themselves in this room full of people. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even if they're not experiencing all the same things, they're not at the same stage of the disease, you know, they, they have something in common and they can then look beyond that and see the person for who they are. I think, you know, that's one of the, the greatest joys I have is, is getting to know people for who they are to, you know, I can sort of, because I understand Parkinson's, I can, I can say, okay, there's the Parkinson's now put that aside and now see them for who they are. I mean, and that's, you know, finding that and, and being able to have that quality of life, have those goals that they, they want to pursue, you know, continuing to knit or, um, like I said, composing music or, you know, playing with their grandchildren, you know, that's, that's really what's key to living well with Parkinson's is to be able to manage the Parkinson's enough to set it aside and not make that the main thing, you know, to recognize it, to acknowledge it, to treat it, but then to keep living, you know, to, to find ways to adapt, to, um, to just do live your life, you know, and that's, that's really what's so important. Um, Right. finding joy. Yeah, definitely. Just, yeah, yeah, definitely. Accepting it, being aware with it and just kind of, you know, working with it, right. Mm-hmm. Doing the best. Now yeah. the programs that you offer, um, is there a fee for that? And do, and can the, the, the spouse or family members, the caregivers, can they take the programs also? Mm-hmm. Yeah. We, and we encourage people to come with a care partner or a caregiver if they'd like, um, Unfortunately, we do have fees, but, you know, we never turn anyone away for that. We're always happy to, um, to accommodate whatever their situation is. Um, but on the, on the added side, sometimes we find that, you know, people need a little bit of buy-in to, to stay with it. Um, sometimes we all need to sort of put our money down and then, and then, you know, follow through in that way. So we try to keep them really minimal, um, you know, roughly $15 a class, um, and that's really just to keep our program going. But um, again, we we accept anyone who's who's interested, and we really, our mission is to help people live well. So that's that's such an important part. Yeah. yeah. And are the programs ongoing? Yes, yes, they are, and um, we offer many of them virtually. Um, the course was the hardest one to transition in the pandemic because um, anyone who's used Zoom knows that you can't actually sing with other people. Um, so that's that was a challenge, but we made it through. We found ways to adapt, um, and so we have that actually offered hybrid um, uh, in March again, and uh, we meet in Newton, and uh, so people can sing together again. Um, you know, masked if they prefer, but um, we want to keep people safe. But yeah, yeah. great, yeah, wow. And so we're almost at the, the top of the hour. Is there one or two things that you want people to come away with? Um, based on what you shared today, you shared a lot of great information about Parkinson's and how people can live well with it. And maybe give us a little bit more of a seed for (laughs) what to expect the next time when you come back in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, living well with Parkinson's is, is about finding your joy and, and continuing to pursue that and not, not being afraid to ask for help and support to, to achieve that, you know, um, man does not live alone. We are in a community and, and that is, is really key. So, you know, exercise, of course, I always have to say exercise, but, um, and as for part two, yes, um, you know, I'm going to be putting my OT hat on a little bit more to talk about how to adapt things. So, you know, challenges more specifically functionally around things like, you know, buttoning, you know, getting dressed, um, you know, getting around the house, things like that, that can be helpful for people experiencing Parkinson's symptoms um, and just how to adapt, you know, having that mindset of I may not be able to do it the way I used to, but there's something else out there, you know, so it's really important for living well. Wow. I can't wait for that one. <laughs> It'd be very fascinating. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, and I really want to thank you for spending the time here today to share information, really valuable and practical information on how people can live well with Parkinson's. I want to thank you for being here. And I also want to thank the Quincy health department for our partnership and for sponsoring the aging strong program under health links with at um, QA TV. So I want to thank you. This is Debbie Lynn Toomey, Tufts Medical Center's Injury Prevention Coordinator. Until next time, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.